Next speaker is Hilden Nelson from VIB Gent from Belgium. Hilde, please take it away. Thanks a lot, uh, Carol, and thanks uh, for the organizers to give me the opportunity to present our uh, latest work uh, here. So when we think of um, plant biomass or seed yield, it's, it's typically thought of as a final uh, product and an endpoint measurement. However, this comes about by having organs growing continuously throughout the life cycle of the plant. And what I show here is a growing maize plant. And that's actually where the research focus of our team lies in understanding how these organs are growing and what is the coordination between the different organs and between the different growth processes. So typically we focus on uh, different plant organs, um, but our main interest really lies in using maize seedling leaf because this leaf actually has very nice characteristics to study growth. And the first is that it has a spatial organization. And I think also previous in the previous talk of Yvonne, it was shown that in the root system, which is also a linear system, you also have a portion of cells which are dividing, expanding, and which are uh, mature. And actually, you should look at the maize developing leaf in the same way. So at the base of the leaf, there are dividing cells, expanding cells, and mature cells. The nice thing is that the maize leaf is quite large, so you can really sample nice um, portions of, uh, that are enriched in dividing or expanding cells for a lot of uh, genome-wide applications. Now, when the leaf emerges from the world of the older leaves, um, there is also a time factor involved because the uh, size of these particular growth zones, so of the division zone, expansion zone, and the mature zone, it also differs over time. So they are relatively small. They expand as the leaf is growing. They stay maximal when the leaf is appearing and a few days after that. And then these growth zones start to decline again. And so there is both a spatial and a temporal regulation of growth. And we, over the past couple of years, we have identified molecular players for both the spatial and this temporal regulation of growth. And one of these players was called uh, plastochrome 1, which is a cytochrome P450. And when we constitutively overexpressed it, we really saw we only had few transgenic events. And what we saw is that leaves became very big. They kept on growing and the plants failed to, set, uh, to flower or to set seeds. So when we then ectopically expressed very locally this uh, overexpressed this gene, we saw an increase in seedling vigor, final biomass, and also seed yield, not only in the greenhouse, but also in field trials. And so this really triggered our interest to further understand how Plastochron 1 is working. And one thing that is very peculiar, peculiar about this enzyme is that it has an expression that is uh, very tightly regulated along this uh, spatial organization of the different zones. So you should imagine that this is the growing maize leaf with the dividing cells, expanding cells, and mature cells. And what we found with bulk RNA-seq and with qPCR is that the expression of plastochrome 1 drops dramatically even within this division zone. So this means that not all the cells in this division zone are expressing this, this gene, but yet still it has a very critical function in regulating the division uh, capacity. And so in order to further understand this, we went actually closer to the leaf base. And this is actually the position where the leaf is attached to the shoot apical meristem. And when we then looked with in situ hybridizations, we actually indeed saw that plastochron 1 is expressed at the base of the leaf. And when we zoom in a little bit, we see that the expression is absent from the dome of the shoot apical meristem. It also is absent from the emerging leaf primordium, which you see even better in the transverse sections. But it is present in the cells that subtend the, ex, um, the emerging uh, leaf primordium. And so this was a very uh, specialized uh, expression profile, and we couldn't really match it to one particular gene in literature. 
So what we set out to do was doing uh, in situ hybridizations with serial sections. And the first sections we would hybridize with plastofron one and the second section with one of the marker genes we found in literature. And then this is actually a very tedious process. And so then we actually came across uh, spatial uh, transcriptomics, which was until then mainly applied in animal fields. And there were very few studies in plant uh, tissues. And the first one that we uh, were able to test was the in situ sequencing. And in this uh, technology, so here you see the dome of the shoot apical meristem and gradually the emerging leaves. We were able to follow 90 genes simultaneously within the same tissue context, within the same section throughout the shoot apex of a, maize, a growing maize plant. And uh, we did this with a lot of genes that were already known or for which the expression profile was known. So we could validate this technology to known in situ. However, we also tried to use these data to understand the role of plastofron one a little bit better. And by being able to simultaneously overlay these expression profiles, we actually saw that plastofron one was expressed really at um, a sharp demarcation between uh, undifferentiated cells, which are here marked by the expression of rough sheet one, and leaf differentiated cells, which are marked in blue by the outer cell layer uh, four gene. And so plastofron one in, in yellow seems to be present at the boundary between these two genes which actually fit our hypothesis where we saw that actually plastofron one indeed plays um, a role in the timing in which cells exit this undifferentiated state. It also ties up a little bit to, to older and more recent literature where plastofron one was always positioned together with knotted one, which is a homologue of rough sheet one. And uh, very early on, um, PLA1 was already uh, hypothesized or, or shown to be a putative target of knotted one. And so um, this spatial transcriptomics technology has really opened for us now the perspective to further study these uh, interactions. And so what you might see is that although plastofron one is at this boundary between uh, undifferentiated and differentiated, it was not so easy for us to determine whether they exact, were in exact, expressed in exactly the same cells. And for this, we used another possible tool from spatial transcriptomics, which is that if you have a good possibility to segment the different cells within your tissue, that you actually can start to map the transcripts to a single cell in your tissue context. And when we did this with this in situ sequencing technology, unfortunately, we found that the resolution was too low to really conclusively say whether uh, these transcripts were present in exactly the same cells or not. And so for this reason, we actually moved on to an alternative approach, which is called molecular cartography, which you see here um, a subset of the same genes that I showed you earlier, and where we are able to capture this with a much higher resolution than we were able to do this with in situ sequencing. And so here I show a comparison, again, of plastochron one in yellow, the in situ sequencing, the molecular cartography and our own in-house in situ. And the red gene here is an other gene that we are working on, which is called Angusifolia or GIF1. And I use this as an example because it's mainly expressed in the developing uh, leaves. But we also saw that there was putative some co-expression with the plastofron 1 gene, but that this was definitely not in all the cells that were uh, present. And we thought that this would be a good example to study now whether we could map this to a single cell level and whether we could show that these genes are actually co-expressed. And so uh, we applied uh, the cell segmentation. And so this is actually for the moment still quite a bottleneck. We use different types of staining, so both DAPI and uh, cell wall stain. And we have set up a pipeline to do an automated cell segmentation. But as you can see here, this is still not 100% and requires manual curation. 
However, I hope you can appreciate that this inner uh, tiles here are actually segmented quite well. So we uh, continue to work with these. And when we then mapped the molecular cartography data on top of the segmented cells, you really see that each of these cells contains multiple uh, spots, so dots that um, every color is representing a different transcript. And so we now have sufficient counts per cell to really go and look at a uh, co-expression within a cellular context. And so this means that we can uh, start to use now the spatial transcriptomics data set to really make a clustering. And this is a clustering very similar. It's also a SURAT clustering to the single cell clustering that exists. But this time it's based upon our spatial transcriptomics data. But now we don't only have a clustering, but we can map these clusters back to the spatial context of this section here, where you see again um, the shootable meristem here. In addition, uh, this tool also, we can then also start to nominate uh, key marker genes for certain clusters here that we have. So we see again here that plastochron 1, our favorite gene, is also the, the key uh, gene to, um, for certain clusters that we have identified. And with this, we started then uh, to do a co-expression analysis. And so you actually see that not for all the clusters, because you see that AN3 has a much wider expression profile than plastochrome one, but indeed there are certain clusters where we can really show that there are cells where we have co-expression of AN3 and plastochrom one And as I said uh, in the previous slide, uh, we can always bring this back to the tissue context. So here you see uh, cells that only have plastochrom one expression is in red. I know this, this might not be good for colorblind people, but in green, we have here AN3, but in blue, you see cells that co-express both um, genes. And so this now allows us to do uh, a lot of different types of analysis. You can do a cell-centric approach where you say, look, this is a certain type of cells, and now I'm interested to see which genes are co-expressed in this cell type. Or you can do a gene-centered approach where you say, uh, I have a certain gene, and I want to look to other genes that are co-expressed with this gene. So all of that, uh, for the moment, is possible. So. Then I'm already at the end of my presentation, where I hope that I've convinced you that spatial transcriptomics is very much an emerging field, and that is can be now also brought with quite high resolution to plant tissue. And I think it's very complementary to single cell RNA sequencing, and as we have shown, also valuable tool in developmental biology. Over the last months, we invested quite a lot of uh, effort in, in optimizing the sectioning, the imaging, but especially the segmentation and data analysis. And the segmentation can only improve if we have more uh, sections that are partially for the moment still manually uh, segmented, but using AI towards the future, we can still improve uh, upon the automated pipeline that we have made. And uh, there is also, there are different providers out there that start to offer or, or offer spatial transcriptomics. But I hope you also uh, got from this presentation that depending actually on uh, the region of interest, uh, you have a certain resolution. And this then can determine which type of information you can get from uh, the data set. So from the in-situ sequencing, you have a really a large region of interest but a little bit lower resolution, but this is perfectly uh, okay when you want to compare uh, transcriptional profiles. Uh, however, if you really want to go into the single cell uh, level, you might want to invest in a technology which uh, focuses with higher resolution on a smaller uh, region of interest. So um, we have a very nice team within uh, that I co-guide with uh, Dirk Zee, who does this. And for this uh, presentation, I especially want to thank also uh, Klaas and uh, Thomas in his group, because they actually helped us a lot with uh, the co-expression analysis. And with this, I finish, and I would be happy to take uh, questions.
Okay, great. Thank you, Hilde. We have two minutes for some quick questions, so we might not get to every question in the chat. So first question from Cohen de Galas. What was the tissue preservation for the in situ and molecular cartography experiments? Is it fresh frozen or FFPE? Yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention this. It's FFPE. FFPE, okay, great. I have a question from Dominic Berman. Uh, hey there, this is a beautiful work. I'm curious whether the systems that work or for what you have tried need a set of candidate genes or could you discover new genes with an unbiased sequencing approach? So this is all still very uh, targeted approaches. Both of them are targeted. So for the, um, the first uh, in situ sequencing, we, we selected 90 genes. Uh, and for the molecular cartography, we did first pilot that I showed you here is with 24 genes. And then we did a, a subsequent experiment with 100 genes. To my opinion, for untargeted approaches, that is about the maximum for the moment. And most of the untargeted approaches that I am aware of, I put a disclaimer in, um, so far did not entirely reach the same resolution as what I showed here today. But of course they are working on that as well. Okay, great. 